Next up, we have Mark Marquis, VP, Vice President of Strategy, Marketing, and Product Development for Global Workplace Solutions, a division of Johnson Controls, Building Efficiency Business. Thank you, Mark. Thanks everybody, and, uh, and thanks for uh, for having us here. And, and I want to thank Philip. And I got to say that when I come to uh, to events like this uh, and, and others across the world that inspire us to think about the future, uh, to Nigel's points, to ask questions, um, and contemplate things that we just don't, don't have time to contemplate in our day to day jobs. And frankly, I think that's that's something that excites me uh, tremendously. Uh, and I think uh, you know, I'll reflect on on the other comment that this is really about asking questions about the future. I think anybody that stands up here. In, suggest that they have the answers to everything about the future. And I think that's uh, I think that's fallacy. And I think we really have an opportunity to make sure the right questions get asked. And then we start to explore what those answers might be and explore um, some scenarios. So you know one of the things I think you guys are, are actually dying to, to for some PowerPoint. So I'm gonna try and give you a little bit of that. Um, but, uh, but before I before I do that, you know I gotta reflect on, on a couple of our first speakers because I thought they were fantastic. Um, li you know, listening to Sherry, I think there was actually some things that I learned about uh, about my kids, and I didn't expect that was going to be my first takeaway. Um, when we talk about technology and its influence, I'm telling my kids are seven years old, so I get seven-year-old twin girls. Um, sorry, they're nine. See, I'm playing twice. <laughs> they're nine. But we've, we've kept them away from technology till they were about seven, so they're only now just starting to explore the iPad and things like that. And so they're starting to become, you know, the digital natives that they will be. Um, but they look at me, and I, you know, I have, I'm, I'm part of a global team. I'm, I'm one of these uh, knowledge workers that works from home. Um, and I'm on the phone a lot, and, and I spend the vast majority of my time on the phone. And my kids try to understand what that is, what that means, how that works. And you know, they, they come up to me and say, Daddy, no offense, but your job sucks. You know, they, they think about a job as something that you go, you do, you touch, you feel. You know, they're the animals, they want to be a veterinarian. They don't realize that, that the society and the world we live in has so many more jobs and, and opportunities. I think what I learned from Sherry is that as they become digital natives, I don't think they were commenting about the fact that I have that knowledge worker job. They were commenting about the fact that I talk. I think in the future they'll be saying, you don't want to talk, you just want to text all those conversations. So thank you very much, Sherry. I, I fully appreciate where they're coming from now. Um, I want to give you a little bit to just to, you know, Sherry had her book up there, so I'm going to leave this slide up here for a little time. Um, no, seriously, I want to just give you a little bit of perspective. I think perspective is important. As we think about the future, we all look at the future from diff through different lenses and from different perspectives. And certainly we're part of a, of a very large organization, you know, multi-billion dollar organization that has three big divisions. I happen to be part of this building efficiency division uh, in the middle, which is about a $15 billion business. And, and our global workplace solutions piece is, a, is about a you know, four and a half, five billion dollar business within that. We're part of a bigger family that includes an automotive division. You know, many of you, maybe not in New York, not too many of you could be drove, uh, drove in cars, but when you're in your car, when you're at home, when you're driving, chances are, regardless of the car you're driving, you've got a component within that car surrounding you that was, uh, that was developed and, and installed by Johnson Controls, whether it's the seating, whether it's the electronics, whether it's the interior trim. Um, and when you look at convergence, you think about technology and some of the comments we heard earlier, um, all of these devices, these toys, these things that we interact with, they're starting to converge. And so we have an electronics group that, that is dealing with the convergence of technology in car, because we, we never want to have these things go away from us, right? So, so there is convergence, and, and some of the things we'll talk about today as we think about the future um, really are related to this. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm, in many respects, I'm speaking um, for some of the work done by a colleague of mine, who many of you will know, Marie Fouru, um, and she runs our global workplace innovation business. And you know, she initiated a program a couple of years ago with her automotive group, which is about road mapping and understanding the future. So a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today uh, is really as a result of an intersection of thinking about what's coming at us and how these things are converging. Um, the actual division that I'm part of, I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, all of these pieces. Of course, we look after real estate functions, projects, and facilities in general. Um, but, you know, why are we so interested in the future? I mean, we are investing in, in, a, in a massive integration program that, uh, that Marie runs. We invest a significant amount of dollars asking these questions, trying to come up with some answers and some directions. And really, it's about helping our customers. I mean, we're also looking internally. We're a big global customer with a, uh, you know, with a global portfolio of diverse businesses. Well, many of our customers live and operate in that same world, and we're all dealing with these things that are coming at us quickly. So we, we believe there's great value in exploring them, both to understand how they might impact um, our customers, our customers' customers, um, ultimately um, their business, and, and you know, I, I guess at the end of the day, our business. So we focus on this, we pay attention to it, and, uh, and we're really trying to, like everybody in this room, understand um, what the future holds. 
So I want to walk you through uh, a few things today. We want to talk about some findings specific to workplace today. And I just helicopter up from that and think about what else does the future hold? What might that be telling us? Um, what, what are some of the things we might need and want to watch? And that's where this road mapping concept comes in. It, it, it looks at some trends, macro trends, micro trends, uh, that, uh, that are affecting our world and ultimately going to affect the way we think about the workplace. Um, and then really, you know, some posturing as to, you know, what might we do about that? How can we respond and react to that? What does readiness look like, the concept of readiness? So thinking about, you know, where we are today, um, it, you know, it's interesting. When you look at the actual uh, metrics on workplace, many of, you, many of you will be familiar that our workplaces are very highly underutilized. And if you look at the typical workplace, you know, the, I'm going to show you some stats in a minute, but the average is about 48% utilization globally in some of the studies we've done. So 48% of our workplaces are not being utilized. You know, at any given point in time through the workday, there's nobody in half of that. You know, so you think about how, how does a CFO react to that? How does somebody who's interested in the financial return of an asset or an investment respond to the idea that, well, you know, we're doing pretty good. We use it about 48% of the time. Um, pretty provocative question, right? Pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um, dynamic, and I guess you could say, well, is that uh, is the glass is the glass half empty or is it half full? Is that a massive challenge facing our business, or maybe facing landlords, or is that a massive challenge or opportunity um, that we can respond to and do something about? It? You know, when we look at uh, at some portfolio statistics uh, across the world over the past 10 years, we've done about 160 studies across 20 countries, and you sort of see the range, uh, you know, of of measures on this notion of, uh, of utilization. I mentioned on average we get about 48 percent. Uh, in use, you know, around 50 percent in North America, as high as 80 percent in some of the South American studies we've done, uh, towards the 60 percent mark uh, in Asia, and quite a mix uh, in in uh, in Europe, you know, from the from the high 30s, low 40s, into some somewhat higher numbers. But it's pretty indicative of of uh, the reality that we live in, and that is that the workplace is a very interesting and dynamic place that's not necessarily being used um, the way we think uh, it, it should, or at the levels we think it uh, should. And I guess that that begs the question. Why or, or, or what you know? What are some of the dynamics behind that? You know, at the same time, the notion that 30% of meeting rooms are in use at any one time is the same idea. I mean, think about that. 70% of the time, all this space we dedicate to, to meetings and, and collaboration is uh, is not necessarily being used. So there's something fundamental going on. Something that I think we can uh, we can potentially learn from. Um, the other thing I'll talk about for those of you that attended WorkTech uh, here last uh, last year, uh, one of our colleagues uh, presented a. a research tool uh, all in a day's work that we're using today with customers and we launched it about a year ago and we've been using it now with customers over the past year and we've done about eight studies across three regions and a multitude of, of countries and about 1400 respondents and it's all about trying to understand how do people use their work their, uh, their workspace and the workplace what are some of the barriers they find and have to productivity in that uh, in that workplace and it's an interesting tool that allows them to rate and rank those barriers and talk about the impact that it has on them. You know, so as we analyze that work, we inter you know, interestingly, we, we find that there's a couple of different things going on. On one hand, people expect and want to come to the workplace to collaborate, to interact, to meet. Right? That's actually where you do it today. Um, and then at the same time, they have a need and an expectation to actually get some focus work done. So there's a bit of a conflict there, right? I mean, they, they need to get there and focus, um, yet there's a bunch of other people that are coming there to meet the bits and interact. Um, or maybe they're just quietly texting each other, but uh, but that is a conundrum, and and you know I think that results in in some of the findings, which is that that the challenge is they're finding themselves incredibly unproductive when they're trying to do that focus work. Overall, they're suggesting they're they're unproductive 20% of the time, um, and of that 20%, uh, half of that lack of productivity is when they're trying to do focus uh, the focused work. You know, so things like. Um, you know, noise is, a, is a, was noise, lack of privacy, lack of quiet areas, which of course are interrelated. You know, came up a multitude of times uh, as being big elements of, uh, of the barrier. So you know, it comes back to the to the uh, to the fit for purpose. Um, we see the response in many cases to to this situation is the you know, huddle in, put the headset on, and uh, and uh, and tune out if you will. Something we need to think about. So as we reflect on that and what that might mean. Um, I want to move to talking about some of these additional uh, trends that we see uh, coming at us, if you will, um, and talk a little bit about um, you know, the approach that we've taken. Um, Marie and her team have done a number of, of, of studies, um, and one of those involves looking at the workplace in 2030, and it's not about suggesting that we have an answer or know what that looked like. I think that would be rather, uh, rather bold. Um, but it's about painting some potential scenarios about what might the workplace of the future look like. 
And there's three specific scenarios that are unpacked in that specific study. Um, and there's various dimensions at play. And some of those scenarios might be more applicable to, um, to a, uh, uh, one type of customer, you know, somebody in finance or, or, or somebody with high security needs. Another type might be uh, applicable to, uh, to a technology or knowledge worker firm. But the point is that these scenarios let us think about and interpret the various um, inputs we get from a variety of service, uh, surveys on how we could potentially see the workplace unfolding in the future uh, and shaping around and, and becoming sort of multi-dimensional so that we make sure we can encapsulate and build in the different areas that are necessary to achieve the, the things that people are going to the office to achieve while not detracting from the other folks who are trying to do that other thing, that, uh, that focus work. So there's some scenarios in there that really talk about what might those components be and, uh, and what might they look like. And some of the things, um, you know, when you look at that and you, when you look at expectations um, of what people are, are, are posturing that they're going to need and what the, the workplace might look like, a couple of key points uh, came out. And then this particular source was, was a study on Collaboration 2020, uh, you know, which is all about is that hyper-competitive advantage and how do we actually take, it, uh, take uh, advantage of the opportunity. A couple of things that came out, and that is that the, that the role of the office is very much becoming um, a function to support that collaboration. But we struggle to understand what does that mean, right? It's not just a collaboration room. We know it involves, to some extent, technology. We know there's other elements of it, but generally, um, there's a feeling that there's a gap, and it's, a, it's an infrastructure gap, uh, and it's a technology gap. Um, you know, I often postulate with, with, with customers, you know, we've had to, in the real estate facilities management world, we've had this notion that one day HR, IT, and real estate is going to converge. I mean, that's been a fundamental study of Cornet going back a number of years. I believe one of the key drivers to that is the acceleration of technologies. Because if you think about it, if workplace and workspace is a place where we expect people to come and collaborate, well, I got to tell you, the digital natives coming into the world, they don't just collaborate with space. They collaborate with their gadgets, with their tool, right? They, they, and they view it as an extension of themselves. And so when they come into uh, to the workplace and, and expect to get things done, they're not going to leave that behind. It's going to come with, and they're going to have an expectation of similar um, facilities available to them in the, in the workplace. So what... With that sort of backdrop, then what are some of the other things that, that we're seeing? You know, this, this concept of BYOD, I think everybody knows what uh, BYOD is. Ask the question, bring your own device. How many people today work in a company that enables you to bring or use whatever technology device you, you require? I'm going to guess that we got about a third, of the, a third of the companies here. I think, you know, I think this notion is pretty critical, and, it, and it, it's sort of germane to that discussion about convergence, right? Because the reality is, think about the impact of that to your, to your, you know, to the folks in IT and organizations, right? I mean, they're a, they're a corporate service group that's trying to deal with this situation, and it's hugely disruptive for them. It's hugely disruptive. But I got to tell you, if you listen to everything that, that Sherry said, um, we've got a, a workforce that's coming at us that absolutely is going to have an, ex an expectation of seamless technology between what they do in their day-to-day -day life and what they do at their workplace. Because we all know that that notion is blurring, right? I mean, I laughed when I was sitting there thinking about what are all the things you can do wrong in your bedroom. You can have your laptop in bed, you can sleep with your phone, right? And, uh, and you can do all that, or you can work on both of those things while you're watching TV with your kids. How many are guilty of that? Um, so there's this blurring going on, and this is absolutely you know, indicative of a, of a trend, an emerging trend that's going to affect us, it's going to affect real estate and facilities and workplace, and it's going to affect our, our technology team. You know, some of the other emerging trends we look at, uh, and you know, one of the things about this road mapping exercise is we very much look at emerging trends, we group them, we look at micro trends, we look at macro trends, we combine these trends, we look at when they, they're expected to peak and hit, and we try and come up with what we call meaningful combinations. So try to understand, you know, which of these things together are actually going to affect our customers or ourselves or, or our business and so forth. And so we look at them across a number, number of dimensions. And, and uh, you know, that, that uh, particular um, Roadmap, you know, we fill this wall with very interesting uh, things that we could all have a great time talking about. Um, but I'm going to touch on just a couple of them just to give you an idea of some of these things that, uh, that are factors. Um, the notion of experience of society, societies, so the notion of redefining the experience at work. I think every day we're out in the real world today, we are faced with a situation where, where we want experiences, right? In the consumer society, experiences are being created for us. You know, I attended and had an event at a hotel. 
where I couldn't believe it. I walked in, there was no check-in desk, right? And I walked in, you've got this very um, natural, um, sensual environment, you've got people greeting you with iPads, we sat down on a bench to check in, and it was all on the way to the elevator, and they handed me a bottle of water as I came in. That was an experience for me. I talk about that everywhere I go, right? So the notion of experiences are critical. We got, we got auto retailers right now. Fiat is, is, is opening up. Uh, they're saying the regular notion of a dealership and the experience people have with dealers and buying a car is horrible. Don't want to do that anymore. We now sell our cars by putting them with cafes. So there's restaurants and Fiat cafes that are together. Go for a meal, go sit in a car and check it out without somebody pushing on you, right? Totally different. There's 10 of them. Who would have thought that? Who, to think about the real estate group that's not going to look after those facilities. We're doing what? <laughs> what? Are, in our facilities. So the whole notion of experience society is something that I think is affecting us. And the expectation of those experiences is coming into the workplace as well. And, and, and I think we can think about that as a vehicle to enable us to, to move the workplace in a direction that, uh, uh, that is more, uh, more, more productive. Sustainability, I think sustainability has been hot for a while, right? But there's this, this whole notion of, of um, you know, our research suggests that 94% want people to go beyond sort of the minimum. People are expecting you to be green. But they're also expecting you to do it in unique ways. I mean, we're, the concept of green luxury is coming into place, right? I mean, it started off where it was really cool. You wanted to buy a smart car. Now, now people want to they want to buy a luxury car that happens to be really green as well, right? So we're seeing these things coming into play. And I think there's a, there's a play on the workplace that's related to that. The concept of pixels everywhere, right? Everything is going to be Everywhere you go, you've got the, the opportunity to interact with things that are digital. I think as we explore the workplace and the expectations of the incoming workforce, it's something we need to consider. We really need to consider it. Um, the, uh, you know, we've got customers of ours that are creating these experiences for their, for their customers in the banking sector, right? They're creating the idea to come into a branch and have touch screens everywhere. Because you know what? This new, uh, this new customer doesn't really want to talk to somebody. They don't want to be pressured. They actually want to interact. Um, and they want to do that on their own, at their own pace. It's the way we're used to working. Um, a collaborative platform, the, the office, the use of team spaces, intensive collaboration, and back to the notion that there's an expectation that there's powerful tools that support that collaboration. You know, this is a mix and a meld of, of the physical in the office and the electronic in the office. And the mix and the meld of the people that happen to be in that space versus the people like myself who are in a you know, home office somewhere or halfway around the world in a different time zone. Um, we absolutely have to um, figure out how do we get that merging and convergence happening at a pace that, uh, that, that re respects the, the, the speed of change that we're all dealing with. And then, you know, the, the last sort of trend is this trend of nomadism. The idea that, you know, these digital natives, um, they feel entirely comfortable with their whole world in their pocket or in their phone or on their, on their iPad. Um, and they're comfortable working just about anywhere, whether it's Starbucks, whether it's uh, in the office, or whether it's at home. And they expect all of that to come with them, right? And so, you know, we've got people, and I think this example with Steelcase, the notion of, of integrating technology into furniture whereby people who are coming with these devices and their expectations on technology are actually having a, you know, a, a vehicle that enables them to do that pretty seamlessly. Again, another trend that we think is pretty important to pay attention to. And then, so if you think about those trends and the things that are coming at us, they really do raise a lot of questions, right? Um, and, and if I were to, uh, to, to try and sum it up in, in, a, in a couple of key points. I think the experience of work is changing. I think we would all agree on that. I think we'd all agree that um, these and many other trends that, uh, that many of you would bring up um, are impacting the way we need to think about the workplace and the questions we need to ask. And I think if you, if you reflect on what are these key things I've had to give you a takeaway and say, you know, how do we prepare? Well, I think it's about being receptive and adaptable and listening to the questions that your colleagues are asking and asking really good questions and ask them about this notion of nomadic behavior. Think about digital environments and that experience. Um, you know, the, the digital environment, the digital tools are often part of that experience uh, that, uh, that gets uh, presented to uh, whether it's an end customer or a worker. Um, think about being responsive and adaptable to environments and that really means think about, think about flexibility because what, you know, what we think might uh, answer the mail today is not going to necessarily answer the mail tomorrow and focus on the notion uh, of intense collaboration. And you can see the intersection of many of these, uh, you know, these different pieces. Um, we truly believe that by thinking about the things that are coming at us and asking these tough questions, we can really redefine um, the world of work. We really have an opportunity to think of that cup as truly being uh, you know, half full, uh, and we've got a great opportunity to fill it the rest of the way. We've all got to be cognizant of the, uh, the generations that are coming. At the same time, you know, we're entering, we're entering a, a realm where 
where you know, we're going to have five different generations in the workforce at the same time. So you can't do everything for one particular, and you have to find and understand and ask the questions that help you build the bridges uh, between, these, uh, between these generations. Tremendous opportunity, and uh, thank you for giving us just a little bit of time to talk about, uh, to talk about this topic. available during the break. It's now break time. We have a 30 minute break and for those of you who are wondering, we're using the time that's on the clock right back there. There's a turn around and look. There's a red digital clock right up in the audio visual booth. Um, we need you back here at 10.55. We will start promptly so that we can um, get our uh, morning speakers on the stage. So thank you very much. We'll be back in 30 minutes. 30 minutes.